For me, it's all a financially driven decision. That's when I go in and I, I just tell them, audit your property. Here's how you audit it. How much equity do you have in it? What did you pay for it? How much total cash do you have in the property? What's realistic cash flow look like over the next 12 months? Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. Well, hello and welcome to today's episode of the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast. My name is still Derek Felch, and I am one of six hosts who bring you conversations three times a week on a variety of topics around real estate business and personal motivation. We have a simple goal with this podcast, and that's to help you succeed in whatever target you're aiming at. We are all committed to finding the best and the brightest people who aren't just talking about doing big things but are actually taking the steps to achieve their dreams and want to help others along the way. And today is no different. I am joined by the one and the only Mr. Bill Faith. Bill is the founder of Build Short-Term Rental Wealth. He's the host of the STR Unfiltered podcast. He's a real estate investor himself in short-term rentals. He also leads courses and workshops and masterminds and also puts on the STR Wealth Conference in Nashville. And I'm going to be honest before we get to Bill. I... Uh, and you'll hear it in the interview. I, I was not too sure what to think. Um, I had listened to some other podcasts Bill has done. I, I did some quick research on him and I thought, man, is this guy just going to come on and try to work in about every third answer to, well, I've got this course you should buy. And, um, and to be very honest and upfront with you, the listening audience, I was totally wrong. I really made a judgment and an assumption about Bill. I kind of admit that at the end. I found this an incredibly engaging conversation. We talk about short-term rentals, so there's some value in that. We talk about his thoughts on the market. Currently, we talk about what to do if you bought a short-term rental and now you're wondering, uh-oh. And we talk about courses and we talk about masterminds and we talk about where to spend your money. Um, but I also just listen to Bill talk about his family, talk about having a plan, having an having a a specific plan in your life. You'll see I struggle with that word a little bit this podcast. And I just I encourage you uh this is a long conversation. I could have I could have easily gone another hour. Uh I had so many questions to ask him. I hope you'll listen to it all and and find the time whether you own a short-term rental, whether you even care about short-term rentals. I don't, it, it doesn't matter. You will find value and something Bill has to share. Um, and I just, uh, I really appreciate Bill's time coming on today. And I learned a ton uh, and answered some questions for myself. Uh, and also was just a reminder, isn't it uh, true how much we make assumptions about other people that we've seen online? And we're like, oh, well, this person must be like this and this person must be like that. And and it's just an unfair judgment um, that we put on other people that we haven't bothered to get to know and meet. I feel like we could have some societal lessons there, but I digress. And we're just here to talk about life and investing. So uh, with that, I, I don't want to keep talking, but I could. I'm kind of feeling that high of, of talking to Bill. I hope you find it enjoyable. And, uh, and well, with that, let's get straight to Bill. Well, welcome, Bill. I appreciate you being a part of our podcast today. And uh, glad to have you on. Uh, you are, I did some research and studying on you. You are definitely known, well known in the short term rental industry. And that's kind of where you are focusing a lot of your energy on. Um, lots of people, I've listened to some other podcasts, lots of people ask you lots of the same questions. So I'm going to try to think of new questions. But one thing I'm curious about is what are your thoughts on the short term rental market right now? It just seems like it's changed a lot in the last few years. And I'm curious what you think as someone who owns them and operates in that space, talks to lots of people in that space. Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of fear right now, to be honest with you. I see fear because people are people, one people, the rents are down for most people. Um, I it, are the my SCR Wealth Conference. I talked about you know literally the data. We're talking forty one percent down just in the last six months, year over year, and that was back in March. I guess is when we had the conference. 
Um, and that's data from STR Insights. It's not just me looking at my portfolio or the 400 properties in my mastermind group. It's it's something that's real data that's happening. And I think that a lot of people that do what I do are causing part of the panic because they're in they're really exacerbating the Airbnb bust mentality. The the hashtags out there. I think people like myself that have masterminds and courses where educators are using that to fear monger and sell product. I've been around longer than COVID. So I just see this as a standardized correction, just like we see when the market goes up and down, just like we see when housing goes up and down, oil prices go up and down and they have to correct themselves. We've been on this ridiculous run uh, since about June uh, when most of the country opened after COVID. If you're in the South, COVID wasn't really a thing. Um, you know, we, we were closed for like a month. Um, so, I mean, it's been great. And I love that my, my revenues from 2019 to 2020 went up by 45 or 50%. And then 20 from 21 in a year over year went up by another 40 or 50%. And then a 20 to 30% increase into 2022. So I'm fine. I mean, I've always based my investing when I'm running performas based on real numbers and, and somebody, nobody asked me about this. So I really appreciate you doing it. Um, when I like, when I'm looking to invest, I use STR insights and air DNA and I, my portfolio right now is performing at 54.1% over air DNA's 90th percentile, their highest percentile. I only budget at the 90th percentile. So I don't factor in cost segregation benefit. I don't factor in appreciation. I don't factor in that additional, you know, percentage because I, I go through a good, better invest. And the best is, hey, AirDNA or STR Insight says this property is going to do 100 grand. I'm not, even if I know for a fact I can do 200, which is insane to be able to double it. And that's what happened with my most recent purchase in Montana. It's a lifestyle asset. I'm not looking to make hundreds of grand. I just want to pay for itself until I retire. Uh, and it was 98,000 bucks. There is absolutely unequivocally no question that I will do 200. It's impossible for me not to because of what I've done. I've amenity that property. I can out host everybody in the white fish market because it's, it's old school, traditional property managers. There's not the people that are doing the off-platform marketing and that type of stuff. So I think being really conservative, all I see this is, to be perfectly honest with you, I think it's a correction. I think we're, uh, I'm seeing numbers today that are even still about 10 to 12% portfolio wide uh, or above where I was in 2019. And I think I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to have a strong summer at at least 50, 60% of my portfolio. What, what's in question and what I think will really be the telltale sign is what's going to happen in the fall when we're in the shoulder season. Um, you know, and let's put the the popular ski markets, whether it's Vermont, Aspen, or North Carolina aside, that's really driven by snow. So my opinion is I think 2024 is going to be a little bit worse than 2023. Uh, but if you've bought right and you're doing the right things as a host – to actually separate yourself from the competition and you have a high demand property. We recorded four video casts for my STR super team this morning. And the whole discussion comes back to the uniqueness of the property and to where we can stand out from the competition. That standard three, two that everybody bought in 2000, the middle of 2020 through the middle of last summer, and they could just plop it up on the Airbnb and Verbo and make a hundred grand in revenue is a thing of the past. The saturation is real in that middle space. You've got to be elevated to the top or you got to be a low margin, high volume player in the bottom. There's a reasons that Kmart's have gone away. Sears's have gone away. But you know what? Nordstrom's still around and you're still going to have Walmart and pick and save and those smaller. Same thing with restaurants, middle of the road, like the halfway quick service restaurants, really the Applebee's types, Ruby Tuesdays. Those are gone or going away right now. It's lower quick service. It's like the Chipotle's that are thriving, the Panera's that are thriving, that still have sit down. And it's the higher end steakhouses and Italian restaurants. We as investors need to choose one or the other. And you really need to pay attention specifically if you just got into this business in the last three years, because that's what we had to do from 2013 through 2019. That's really good. I, I appreciate you saying that, Bill, because I feel like 
there's some people I respect a lot that, you know, there's this conversation about saturation. Can a market be oversaturated? You know, is it still a good time to buy? I come from a hotel background, so I've spent the last 30 plus years in the hotel industry. And I've seen these cycles where, uh, you know, in the town I'm in now, where, you know, the hotels all do really well. There's strong demand. So then everyone thinks, hey, we should build more hotels in that town. And then they open them up and then there's not enough there's not enough demand to meet that supply and you have to work through the cycle till the demand builds. And like, we're back now to where we don't have enough supply in our town. So there'll be more hotels coming. Then we'll all struggle. Uh, I, are you, is there still opportunities? Do you think like if someone's listening to this and they haven't bought, uh, yet, are, are you encouraging people to, to buy right now? Or are you encouraging them to kind of wait or what, what are you telling people? I don't encourage anybody to do anything except for to have your, your plan, your lifelong plan. Even if you're 24 years old, listen to your parents, listen to your professors. What if you just graduate from college and build a plan? This is not for sale, but this is what I use for my plan. I built this in 2016 with a mentor of mine. I audit myself every day. Um, I couldn't do the podcast like with you words, we started at 5 p.m. because from noon to four every Friday, me and my wife meet and we're auditing our successes and failures as parents, as best friends, as husband and wife, lovers and business partners. Right. And it's and I, I, I've done my wife hates this, but it's not just about how much money did we make in the last week? Are we moving towards our financial goals of retirement? It's like how many times did we have sex? How many times did we have intimacy that was not sexual intercourse? How much real time, non-phone, non-television did we spend with our kids? We're auditing all of that stuff because we have a documented plan. So one of the things that I think is a big issue is people buy property to property. You should be buying based on your plan. You should be auditing your, your cash and return on equity right now based on your plan. So I am. I, I asked my super team this morning, and I don't know if you know who my super team is, but like even Avery Carl's on there. And, um, you know, I've got the best CPA, the best data analyst, all these. Every one of them is buying right now. We're not afraid of the market turning down. We're not afraid of rents, you know, stabilizing. We're not afraid of interest rates. Because if we run a, an, an educated performa and the property works to hit 15, 20, 30% cash on cash, whatever type of IRR, whatever type of cash flow you're looking for, those are my three main metrics. If I can hit one of those based on the investment, I'm going to make the investment. And I think it also presents more opportunity for me to reposition. Most people are probably in the seven and a half to eight and a half percent rate right now, depending on what they're buying, right? Well, if you're at seven and a half or seven and three quarters, don't you think there's going to be an opportunity in 24, 36, at least 48 months? I guarantee you there will be after the presidential election, regardless of the regardless of the outcome. So I don't want to talk about politics, but I promise you we're going to see an opportunity of a rate drop of at least one and a half to two or two and a half points. It may be short lived. But it's going to happen, right? So I think it gives us the opportunity to reposition without having to go through the whole ARV syndication thing, you know, to actually do a real multifamily reposition, even in single family homes. So I'm a buyer today, but I also have cash, right? So I sit on a lot of my the most cash I've ever had in my life right now. And I want everybody to understand I am very conservative. I am not a Robert Kiyosaki, you know, leverage at 90% or 100%. I'm 50. I just turned 50 last month. I'm on my my day. My, my days are numbered to when I retire to what I've defined as retirement. So I'm trying to clear debt. But that's one of the reasons that I don't own 50 properties. Because I've hit my revenue goals of what I need for my outcome inside of my owned portfolio. I've hit those inside of my co-hosted portfolio. I've hit those for my family. So I'm in sustain mode and what I call optimize mode. So I did my return on equity and audit in April and decided I was going to sell a property in Beach Mountain, North Carolina that I've only owned for a year. And I turned a $27,000 net profit off of it, but I had $140,000 in cash into it. And if I sold the property, I can clear 170 grand. I cleared like 168,900 closed two days ago. And people are like, why would you sell? Is the market saturated? Yeah, the market saturated because I told everybody how good it was when I first invested and people followed me into the market. And what happened is, is they did the same stuff that I did in a super small market with only like 600 
STRs in it, and it leveled up to the level. So I have no place to go to continue to separate myself. So I'm pulling my cash out, cost me zero because this is a 1031 property, and I'm reinvesting it into another property. So I'm putting that, really rolling it all the way up to a $1.46 million uh, four-bedroom townhome in the heart of Bozeman, Montana. Um, and people may say, why Bozeman? Well, Bill loves Montana. Has nothing to do with that. Has to do with, it's almost impossible to get short-term rental permits in that market. It is the the number one market that has been affected the most by the lack of affordable housing. So, I mean, there's this all these different traffic drivers and kind of deeper research, compelling rationales of why I'm redeploying the cash into that market. So that's a very long-winded answer. That's why I am a buyer today, um, but I'm not saying that everybody should be a buyer. And most importantly, if they're not cash rich right now, and if you don't have your personal savings behind your investment money, if you don't have the ability to make the investment and then have to cash flow that for at least six months to 12 months on your own, don't make the investment. If you don't have the carry costs for six to 12 months, don't make the investment. I think that's really good advice. I think that's some of the best advice I've heard in a long time. So thanks, Bill. Can we go You're back welcome. to talk about your plan? Because this fascinates me. Have you always been someone that had a had a plan? Do you, is that is that kind of your personality, or is that something that you learned or acquired that the need for that life plan and auditing and all of that it, it, along your journey? I had a plan that I was going to be a professional athlete from a young child. I graduated from high school as the third ranked golfer in the world. I've got a full ride to UCLA and I blew that thing up in about five, five months. I dropped out. I thought I was, had the world by the, you know what? I was the best golfer in the world. I dropped out and turned professional. So I achieved that goal. Uh, that lasted about four years during that journey. I started my entrepreneurial career even before I got to UCLA actually. Uh, but no, I did not have a plan. I went through 23 startups built two $30 million companies and a $50 million, 50 plus million dollar company. Had one company with over 700 employees at one time. I figured out I never wanted that again, that's for sure. But I was chasing money and, and what I, I was chasing businesses. I love building stuff. I love the startup. It's not about the money. It, it, part of it's about the money, to be honest, but it's really about building something and doing stuff that people say I can't do. I've employed, I was drop shipping Brazilian bikinis in 1993 on AOL chat rooms and Netscape, if anybody remembers that stuff. Because I just happened to run to stay with a family in a t small town outside of Sao Paulo, Brazil, when I'm playing the South American PGA Tour, and they were making them. And I said, can you ship these to me for DHL? Funny story, because we all know we can go uh, literally whip up an e-commerce uh, website today for about 500 bucks and do it in two days on Shopify with every plugin you need. It cost me $182,000 to build an e-commerce website and took five months back then. So I've done a lot of stuff. I was chasing money. I've been married for, this is 2015. Um, I got married in 97. I just had my 25th anniversary. So I've been married for 15 years. My 17-year-old daughter at that time was about six or seven. And I grew up with a mother who was a teacher and a principal, never made a whole lot of money and divorced and had no father. And my wife came to me one time and, and said, you know, I don't want you to turn into your father. And I'm like, whoa, what do you mean? Because I just despised my father for leaving. Um, and she's like, you are working so much. I just started a ground transportation company. I had like four businesses going at that time. And she's like, we haven't had a vacation in four years. And you just missed Gentry's dance recital for like second grade or whatever it was. And that was kind of an aha moment. I was in an organization called EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, this global uh, you know, group that's awesome. But unfortunately, there was one thing that's fundamentally missing and broken in their model, in my opinion, that's all it is, is we were set into forums like many masterminds, and we had no chairman, we had no moderator, we had to self moderate. So I was one of the overachievers, a group of eight people, nine, nine people, there were three, two, three other guys that were overachievers, everybody else would show up late, didn't have PLs, didn't have financials. One day I walked in after about four months, I said, fuck it, I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm going to start my own group. If anybody wants to follow these rules, come with me. Three guys came with me, and the first thing we did was hire a chairman. Guy's name was John Bairden. First meeting, he throws his binders down. I'd never met him before. Three three-ring binders. He's all, if you show up late, it's a $500 fine. If you're more than 15 minutes late, 
you don't get access into the meeting. Not only are we doing six-hour meetings once a month in person, but you better have your financials. If you don't have P&Ls, you don't have balance sheets up to date, it's a $500 fine. That $500 is going to go to pay for our annual trip that we're doing. And if you guys slack off, we're going to have a great trip. We're going to Paris or a safari in Africa. So he, he threw down the law for th these guys that were successful, but we had no accountability, none. And so we thought we were going over financials. He basically said, put all your binders and all your financials on the ground. He said, you guys want to want to strive to achieve to be like me, right? And we're all just nodding our head. Yeah. You know, he's worth probably 50 million at the time. He's retired, had been a Fortune 500 CEO. He was then an angel investor. And most of our companies were in the, the one to $10 million range. And we had two that were in 15 to 20 at that time. And, you know, he didn't know, like I'd grown a couple of decent sized companies, but he started talking about what had happened, the, the, the turmoil with his family and that his oldest son hadn't spoken to him in seven years, who was now the president of a bank and like 32 years old, that he'd been married three times, all these things. And we, he started building out the life plan and showing it to us. He's the one that taught it to us. His name's John Bairden. At my SDR Wealth Conference for the very first time, I invited him to come and he sat in the front row and I started crying on stage in front of a thousand people uh, because I got to really just, I don't even know what to call it, but thank him in front of everybody because I've implemented this with about two or three, probably about two, 300 people very privately. I don't sell it, so I don't want you to think I'm pitching it um, you know, with my masterminds and, and stuff like that. And that's been the fundamental thing to really be intentional. And John said one thing, He's all, he says this to me all the time, you have to be able to keep score. So when I, the first thing that I have people do when I teach it is define retirement. And everybody says the same two things. I wanna have financial freedom and I wanna travel. That's what we all want, but that's the plane circling around the airport at 30,000 feet dumping fuel. We gotta pull it down to 10,000 feet and put it onto the runway. Cause I can't keep score with those things. So. My financial goal was $15 million liquidity. It was $800,000 a year in household income, net income, EBITDA off of my businesses. Um, I hit both of those about a year and a half ago. So that's why I'm optimizing now as opposed to trying to grow. I don't need to be Grant Cardone and have a $65,000 G5. I don't need Lamborghinis. You know, I've got a nice Ford F-150. I've got a nice house and I've strategically built my entire owned portfolio, build short-term rental wealth, the market, my STR software platform I just launched for the short-term rental industry, everything based on time and then financial return. So that way, and then the more mobile I can get, I use this about 90% to run all of my businesses. I hate to have to get onto my, I got a, you got a new computer that I've got an, I use iMac and I've got three of them sitting here. I hate sitting here unless I'm doing something like this. I want to be on the go. I want to be at my daughter's soccer practice. So I believe that we can architect our lives if we sit down, put it on paper, and have some intention. And most importantly, if you're married, that you do it by yourself. Then you have the your spouse go through the same process. Then you unite together. And then if you go over number one, if you say yours first, and then your spouse says number two first, and you always are willing to make a commitment to each other to meet in the middle, then you can formulate your plan with intention. But you have to be able to keep score. That's the critical part. So when my social media manager years ago branded what my, me and my wife do on social media is Faith Fridays, it's really an audit. It's us keeping score of what's happened over the last seven days based on the goals that we've set for that week, the priorities for that week. And we hold each other accountable. We do it on Friday, one, because it's easy to do it on a Friday, two, then we still have a day and a half to complete those goals together if we need to help each other before the end of the week and we restart that process on a Sunday. Man, that's good. I, uh, I've heard consistently from other very successful people similar things about, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm in a group that Brandon Turner just started and, and, um, uh, and it, he talks the same thing. Are you thing in his about new mastermind deal? Yeah, I, I'm in the Better Life Tribe. Yeah, yeah. And cool. his, he's just big on tracking, tracking everything, habits, um, and and the accountability piece. Can I? Can I? Can we keep talking about that? Is that all right? I know it's not Whatever short term rental related, but yeah. But how how do you suggest to people to land that plane? Like I, you know, because I do think a lot of us feel 
I think a lot of people have these generic kind of, or we have these goals of retirement or financial independence or travel. How do you build that specificity? Specific? How do you build that specific? Yeah, exactly. That word. Give me seven Uh, years to learn how to say that word. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. How do we build? How do we define a better plan that that does put arms and feet to that. It's really hard to do on a podcast. I did a a 45 minute session at my conference about it this year. I probably shouldn't have done it uh, because it it takes dialogue back and forth uh, because nobody nails it in the first first try, second try or third try. You have to have somebody there to just help you think about being more and more specific so you can use that specificity. We just don't think in those terms. So it took me months to get my plan together. Um, Like I do usually one or two couples retreats a year and this is all we go over. It takes us two days to, I have no more than usually like six couples there. It's not like there's 40 or 50 or a hundred people. And it takes, you know, 10 hours a day for two days to be able to get through this for them to have a plan, you know, when they leave. I mean, it's really simple. It's like the $15 million number I said in in liquidity, basically in cash um, was just an arbitrary number that I picked, you know, out of my head. Uh, and, and the rationale behind it was, okay, that's $5 million for my two daughters. I've got a 14 and 17-year-old. That's $2.5 million each, right? And it's going to pay for college. It's going to pay for a house. It's going to have money to get help them start a business, all that type of stuff. And that's $10 million for me and my wife. If I make 5% conservatively, because I'm very conservative. I don't do crypto or you know Amazon or Tesla stock or anything like that. 5 6%. You know, that's five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. If I'm in the forty percent tax bracket, you know, I'm taking home like if I make five hundred grand, like two hundred grand. That's not that much money, right? To be conservative and to truly build generational wealth where I don't have to tap in to my grandchildren's, you know, trust funds or whatever that's gonna be, college funds. So that's kind of where I came up with that number. And then that's changed and it's manifested. There's no question. That eight hundred thousand dollars is now one point four million, uh, just going from two thousand fifteen to two thousand twenty three, and inflation and the cost of everything. And really, there's only one ostentatious thing, and it's not really ostentatious that I want to add. So, I've added, and one of the reasons it's gone up is I want to get my pilot's license, and I, I want to I want to fly my own plane or have Chris, my COO, get it to where we both can fly. Because most of my business is done within about a seven hour drive time of where I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And I know what I charge for an hour, whether it's a product, speaking engagement, one-on-one coaching. And it's way more cost efficient for me to fly my home plane to go in in an hour and a half, like to get to Gulf Shores, Alabama, I can get there in less than two hours. For me, it's airport, wait there for an hour, hour and 20 minutes to Pensacola, hour to Gulf Shores, you know, rental car line, all that type of stuff, or it's a seven hour drive. So to buy a $400,000 plane, uh, which would be like a Bonanza six seater, I can get my dogs and my my family in it to vacation too. Um, And Chris and I can, big guys can get our gear in there, go shoot video, do whatever. Um, And it's, I can accelerate that depreciation just like I can using section 179, right? Or, Or a cost seg on an airplane like that. So I can basically recapture all of that and use that as a tax benefit. And the cost for me to fly my own plane and my family would be cheaper than actually using Southwest Airlines to fly down there. So I look at those types of costs, there's risk. So I've had to allocate 400 grand to be able to to buy that airplane. Same thing as I do with my my real estate investments, I'm allocating uh, the carrying costs as well, at least for 12 months. And I'm just using that as the example of how you have to forecast those dollars, right? So I'm looking at, I'm when I look at retirement, retirement for me means doing this all day. Like Brandon's kind of semi-retired, right? I'm semi-retired. He lives in Maui. He lives a great life, but he still works. People like us are never going to do, you know, Homer Simpson or Al Bundy type of retirement. It's not sit on the couch with our hand down our pants, watching soap operas all day, drinking whatever people drink. I mean, I'll drink my fair share of wine. Believe me, I've got a wine budget <laughs> in retirement. Um, but it's about how are you going to travel? And this is one of the things. Everybody wants to travel. How many times a year do you plan on traveling? Are you just going to be RVing in the U.S.? Are you going to be doing the year-long cruises at 80 grand a pop? What are you going to do? 
Well, that might change. Well, that's a bullshit answer. Let's define it now. What do you want today? It can change. That's okay. But we have to budget for that, right? So all it is is creating a life budget of what your expenses are going to look like and what level of lifestyle that you want to have. The great thing for me is I have invested every single one of the markets I've gone into or markets that my wife and I want to have in our portfolio in retirement so we can travel around. We'll still keep a smaller home base. But as an example, I'll sell my $2 million house here that I paid $700,000 for in 2005. I have only, I owe like $212,000 on it. I'll take my one-time exemption and I'm going to buy something small. So I'm looking in a market that is not a great STR market to add that last property, which is below Orlando, Florida, like Puerto Rico or Naples or whatever to get the, you know, the tropical weather down there where the, when the pan handles cold, and that's probably going to end up being in Bradenton or Sarasota. And it'll be around a golf course because that fits our lifestyle. So then if I can go in and break even on that and pay down equity, pay down debt for the next five to six years until I retire, that's a much better financially driven decision than it is to wait till I retire like most people are going to do, then go buy a property. And it's going to, one, that's probably going to hopefully has, you know, 10, 20, 30% increase. So that 600 that I might pay or 700 could be, you know, 900 by that time. But also if I can generate any type of cash flow, I can pay down the debt, right? So that's what I'm buying. I've been buying my retirement homes for the last seven years. Man, you're, you're giving me a lot to think about here. So, uh, so one thing I like to ask people, Bill, cause I think it's easy. I, th I, I always think of the person listening to this that has a bit of a cynical view of like, oh, it had to be easy. It had to be, you had a break. Where have you really screwed up in your journey? And what'd you learn from it? it, it it's ironic that you asked that question because I just posted a reel on my Instagram yesterday about it. And uh, it was the biggest mistake that I've made. It was property number two, which I believe in the short-term space, I understand I've been in commercial multifamily and you know stuff since I was 22 years old, I'm 50 now. But in the SDR space, the second property, which I think is the hardest one to purchase for most people, and it was for me, um, I broke every rule of investing. Uh, I was just an idiot. So I believe we have to put our own eyes on the property. I believe we need to use, we should only use agents to represent us that own STRs, that talk our language, that really know the market, that know regulations, all that type of stuff. Um, I was sitting at the 2020, January 1st, 2020 winter classic. I'm a big hockey guy in uh, the Cotton Bowl, watching my Predators get crushed uh, by the, the Dallas Stars. And between the second and third period, probably four, you know, Mondo beers in at that point, signed a document to buy a property in Fort Morgan, Alabama from what I would now classify as a junior agent uh, that I had met online and he found this awesome property and I knew what I wanted to do with it. I didn't see it. Um, literally wired funds the next day to uh, do a cash deal while I was in, um, you know, Dallas still. Um, and I didn't see the property. So those are the first two mistakes. Uh, number, the third mistake is I didn't get an inspection. And the fourth mistake is I thought I could help a contractor that needed help. And he screwed me. I ended up losing $126,000 on that deal. The ironic part is I made $128,000 in net cash off my first STR the first two years that I had it. And that's what I used to buy that second property. I lost all my money. It sucked. So I ended up having to sell the first property after the appreciation ha uh, had happened, uh, after that two and a half years to create enough cash to con to start leveling up, right? If I didn't, if it if that property wouldn't have appreciated, you and I would not be talking here today. But the break is that I learned from it. At the time, I had the goat of agents down in Gulf Shore. She's retired. Her name's Deb Wood. She had owned about 40, 50 of her own properties down there. She grew up there. She had every connection. She was the most trusted agent down there. No business cards, no signs, no website, nothing, just all referrals. And uh, she introduced me to, walked me in personally to two banks down there. And I was a bankable guy. But at that time, I didn't know that local banks, that I could walk into any credit union, any local bank with balloons out on the front of their deal, 
and borrow a million dollars or half a million dollars on a commercial loan to go buy short-term rentals. I mean, I don't know why, because I'd done that for duplexes and, you know, condos and stuff like that. But I just thought short-term rentals are different because I'd heard all the horror stories about DSERs, you know, leading into that. And long story short, I found a new way to to be able to finance and pay down debt faster because the amortization is way better on a 20 year, you know, over the 30 year. And I built strong relationships with them. So she opened the break was she opened up the financing doors for me. I mean, I had some decent money, but I don't didn't have them what I have today. And what I have today, honestly, a lot of it was because of COVID. And I flipped 13 houses and made over three and a half million dollars cash in less than 11 months, just in Gulf Shores. I was never a flipper. But when the market was appreciating at like three to 5% a week, right when COVID started in late 20 through uh, all the way through the summer of 2021, um, I would do a little bit different of a flipping uh, methodology. And then I deployed all that cash uh, to really expand my portfolio quickly. And then I turned into buy and hold uh, after that. But And that was really before Gulf Shores blew up. I haven't been able to buy a property in Gulf Shores shit since November of 21. Uh, because nothing, like zero, has penciled out uh, that I've seen, at least from my uh, standards of what I'm trying to invest in and, and get a cash-on-cash cash, uh, return on. So getting back to the short-term rentals, I uh, obviously there's a lot of people who have bought in Gulf Shores and other markets since November of 2021. And I've, like you, I've struggled to uh, uh, find some properties that pencil out. Like, what what would you say to someone who's probably, I mean, they probably have paid too much for their, or they bought a house, now oversupply has hit a little bit, demand is dropping, prices are dropping. Like, what do you tell people when they, I'm sure you get messages or emails or calls for help or people running up to you, like, like what do I do now? I, I bought this thing, it's not cash flowing, it's starting to cost me money. What should I do? On May 6th, which was my youngest daughter's 14th birthday, we were at the Taylor Swift concert here in Nashville with my two girls and literally had probably an early 20s, mid 20s girl see me as we're walking down to our seats on the floor. Oh my God, Bill, my name's Megan. I listen to your podcast and I follow everything and all that stuff. And I'm like, great, awesome. Thank you so much. And my daughters are like this, just embarrassed. And she's like, I bought a property in the Smokies and I'm getting crushed. What can I do? And she pulls up her listing. I'm like, hey, Taylor's going on. Do you see the countdown in like a minute? She's like, I don't care about that. I need your help. And that stuff comes into my my DMs on Instagram. It's it's five to ten times a day, emails, all that type of stuff. It's um if if you have a high demand property, if your property was like super high demand to where you could command anything that you wanted ADR wise during COVID and it's still in high demand today, you're going to be okay. <clears throat> if it's that average property, that average cabin, that average beach house, that average apartment, you know, for in downtown urban areas, and there's nothing unique, nothing standing out, then you're probably going to struggle. And you, you, it's for me, it's all a financially driven decision. That's when I go in and I, I just tell them audit your property. Here's how you audit it. How much equity do you have in it? What did you pay for it? How much total cash do you have in the property? What's realistic cash flow look like over the next 12 months? And then I tell them, I think it's probably going to get 10 to 15% worse, you know, and they're like, oh my God, it can't get any worse. And I'm like, that's why we need to see what, if it's, if this is a hold or if this needs to be an exit strategy, but I don't think there's, I'm not a systems guy. I don't teach somebody a system, Derek. And I learned that from the, the best golf instructor that I ever worked with. Almost everybody that teaches golf, teaches school, teaches how to invest, whatever it is. Oh, my system does this for you. Well, you know what? You can't fit every human being into a system. You need to teach them fundamentals. And my job is to get people to look through a different lens and help you identify what path you want to go down. That's where I'm different, right? So I had the same conversation with her and everybody else that I talked to about this. What may be right for me is not right for you. So I think number one, it just starts with an audit of your debt position, your cash position, and then build out a performa. If you were to HELOC, if you were to co uh, cash out refi, if you were to sell, you know, what's the best financially driven decision? You have options, 
right? And if you don't have an option, then you better learn how to freaking market better than your competition. So that way you can get more eyeballs onto your property. It's one of the things that if, if you, if you guys, if anybody's listening that's in the short term space and they're not using like price labs or, you know, one of these dynamic pricing tools that gives you the market research, at least the first thing I look at when I get my price labs reports every week is what's the demand. How many searches? And I get this from Kenny Bedwald, SDR Insights as well. I compare both of them. I want to know how much search volume is happening. Because as search volume goes down, that means my marketing efforts off-platform have to ramp up. My Facebook ads increase. My buy-sell trade group strategies increase. My email marketing increases. My text message marketing. All that stuff has to increase to offset that, right? So that's kind of been my superpower, Derek, is really my marketing capability, um, and I think the other part is most of those people that are upside down, they just bought wrong. They bought at the height of the market. Um, and that's, that's, that's problematic when we're buying short-term rentals. It's problematic when we buy single family homes and then you get transferred, you know, nine months from them, you're going to be upside down. In many cases, these people that don't know how to market, they don't know how to do listing optimization. They're just letting Filipino VAs, nothing against Filipinos, but VAs anywhere, you know, just, you know, run their properties for them and do their stuff because they don't have the money, you're probably better off taking a little bit of a haircut if you can get out of it and stop the bleeding, you know, in many respects. But it's different for everybody. And that's that's what I use the term about knowing and being known to where I really have to know somebody's situation, what's behind the curtain uh, before I could really give them a piece of advice. And a lot of people say, Bill, you always talk about yourself. That's because I'm practicing something called gestalt. In my experience, I've gone through this. I don't know you well enough to tell you what to do. I like that. That's really good. How much time do we have, Bill? I could talk to you for hours. You probably don't want to do that, but I've got it. I've what? got at least another hour. Oh, well, let's keep going for a bit longer. When you get bored, you just wave me off or something. But, <laughs> um so let's talk about because you do courses, you do workshops, you do masterminds, right? I mean, you you kind of do all that. I, uh, I started out even probably starting this podcast, a slight, I, I, I grew up kind of cynical about that for a lot of reasons. Um, and, and, but help me understand, because one of the consistent things I found in almost every person I've interviewed is their desire and encouragement for people to join groups. Some of it's to get access to other people. Some of it's for information. Some of it's for accountability. It all depends on those things. But tell me why you think these these types of, why it's worth it for people to invest in these types of courses. And how do people, how do you recommend people determine where to invest their dollars to learn? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I'll tell you that it depends. Uh, it's that typical lawyer and CPA you know, it depends. Um, and I'm not your lawyer and I'm not your CPA, right? So there's lots of people that invest into a $100 webinar or a $500, $1,000 course or a $25,000 mastermind. And then they don't follow through. They think it's a magic bullet that's going to save them or help them or lead them to the promised land. Um, it doesn't work that way. You still have to, it's, all, all they are are different forms of learning. And there's networking and there's access. There's no question. But you have to f really figure out if you're the right fit. Like, I have a thing with my super team, and I've never announced this publicly, ever. It's called the STR War Room. If you go to the super, strsuperteam.com, you can see our War Room link. And if you read that sales page, we are doing everything in our power to keep you out. Right, like if you don't qualify to do this, this is not for you. These these are a bunch of misfits. These are these people. Blah blah blah. It's not selling anything. But if you want to do this and you plan to invest this much money and you're willing to do X, then it may be for you. Right. So I think that it has to be the right fit. The number one, like where should you invest? I'll give you an example. Like my my conference. I don't know if you're familiar with my SDR Wealth Conference or not, but. Um, Everybody comes up to me and my friend, Michael Shogren, who hosts that with me and him and I are so polar opposite. They, should I join your mastermind or should I join bills or should I join Mike's or should I join yours? Well, who do you connect with? That's the most important thing. Who do you trust? 
If you feel like you're being sold to, in my opinion, you probably shouldn't join, period. You so I that's like I don't talk about my mastermind. I don't put it, I don't send emails out about it. I don't run Facebook ads and through the standard, you know, this drill to where you run a Facebook ad and then you go through the application, a salesperson, you know, gets on and hard presses you to to write the check. Oh, you don't can't afford 15 grand here. Do you got 2,500 today? That whole thing that just doesn't fit my MO, right? I'm the guy that believes that if I give you enough value, that if I just absolutely crush what I do for you for free, eventually you will come back and buy something from me based on reciprocity or the trust that I earn from you. I learned that from Dharmesh, Sean, Brian Halligan, the two founders of HubSpot, when I was deeply ingrained into their ecosystem for years at the very beginning. I don't know if you know about HubSpot, but I was their 33rd customer. They're the largest all-in-one marketing platform. And it's one of the reasons that I try to help more than sell. There's times when I have to sell tickets to my conference. I'm in the middle of a launch right now for my new market, my STR software, which is an all-in-one software marketing platform, and I'm selling. But what I do is I tried, like I just did uh, a webinar or a live broadcast on our YouTube channel and stuff. And what we did is we showed people how to build your own direct booking website in less than an hour. We did use our platform, so that's part of the soft sell, but we showed them how to do it and why they don't need to spend three to $5,000 to buy a WordPress site and have it custom developed, and then you can't do anything with it. So I'm trying to educate, and then by the way, if you do want something, you can use lead pages or WordPress or Wix, and I've got this platform. But it's not like, oh my God, I'm the best, you have to have this. So I think that I'm not a big fan of courses, just FYI. I'm a big fan of the one-on-one coaching or one-to-many coaching that's live because that's how I learn. I'm going to practice Gestalt again. I'm a huge believer if you can get into the right group, the right mastermind, uh, and you told me that you're in one right now, right? And hopefully that's the right one for you, then you can have some major breakthroughs, whether it's on the people that are in there and you can do deals with them, you can network with them, they're going to impact you. I believe that you should not buy into a mastermind based on who's selling it as much as who's in it. Let me let me say that one more time because I think this is critical. I believe you should be buying into a mastermind, not based on who's running it, but who's in it. I tell people that, and I have, my mastermind's 15 grand. I had 88 people in my mastermind. And I tell people in person, don't buy into it for me. It's, it is the only way you're gonna get direct access to me without paying for a one-on-one coaching call which is $1,000 an hour because I don't want to do them because I think they're inv- they're not valuable to do something in an hour. But it's the quality of the people that are inside here is who you really want the access to. So I joined a mastermind that has the six most high-powered marketing people in the world in it in 2017. I've spent $100,000 a year to stay in that mastermind. There's nine of us in it, only three of us pay. We pay to get access to those other people so we can go spend $300,000 for three meetings to have $100,000 a meeting for private chefs in cool locations. And I can't even tell you how much that's benefited me. My net worth has gone from about 700000 when I joined that mastermind to over $24 million today. Right? And that is, and I 100% attribute, I'm a smart guy, I can do stuff on my own, but I've been able to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And that's one of the reasons, like I, my, my super team, those are the people, those are all guys, except for Avery Carl, we're all in my mastermind, Kenny Bedwell, Jeff Hampton, John Hodge, Ryan Bakey. And they just happen to be the, the best that I know inside of their respective space that I've had access to. So when I have a tax deal that ties to a new investment, whatever it is, I'm going to Ryan. They're my giants that I stand on, even though I'm one of theirs. Does that make sense? And so I put them together to bring them to the public because that's a really hard thing and something that's missing, specifically having an attorney on asset protection, liability, communicating directly with a CPA. So for me, I believe I'm a value-based buyer and most of us sell our products or our services, whether it's a coffee shop, a limousine service, or STR, based on our own personalities and our own virtues. So I'm a value-based buyer, so I sell value-based products. And if I can't create enough value for somebody to purchase, then they shouldn't purchase. 
Do you think some people, I mean, is there just a certain segment they're just going to keep buying courses looking for <laughs> answers or yeah. um, they're just almost information consumer, almost overload? I mean, I think that kind of goes into all the different buyer, you know, traits, right? And just, you know, natural human inquisition. We all want the silver bullet. We all want the get rich quick. You know, or if we didn't, you know, we wouldn't see billion dollars available on a Wednesday night for a lottery, right? And it has nothing to do with education level. Even, you know, the wealthy want that, right? So I just think it's natural for people to default to that. Um, and there's been a lot of people that have made a lot of money selling courses. Uh, for me, most of most of my money that I make is like in my live events. It's in like I do live events in my mastermind. We meet four times a year in person. Um, it's the the wealth conference, even though Mike and I don't take any money out of it. Um, it's my boot camps, really. It's my couples retreats. It's the stuff that's done live. The interesting thing for me. Like I look at my, I, I was the first person to ever do boot camps in this industry. I brought them from the limo industry. So exactly what I do here, I've done in other industries, right? Because it's all standard business. It's all standard marketing. It's all the standardized stuff. And I have like almost 42%, it's 42, 43. I don't know exactly like 40 plus percent of my boot camps are the same people that come back. So I must be doing something right and driving value for them right? For them to come back and spend between 750 bucks to 1500 bucks for a ticket to come back and learn again. It is different topics every time, but if I didn't deliver value for them, I would think they wouldn't want to come back, right? At least I wouldn't. I wouldn't renew my $100,000 membership every year, you know, for six years in this mastermind if I didn't get value out of it. So I think number one is really, re you got the person like you, the person that you're in their mastermind, I don't know if you want me to say the name or not, but you resonate with them, obviously, right? And there's people that may not resonate with me because I cuss or I'm loud or, you know, I'm old. You know, the younger, the 20 year olds don't resonate with me. There's a few that do, but most of them are resonating with people in their own, you know, age bracket. And I probably don't connect with them as well. I mean, the arbitragers definitely are anti Bill Faith. You know, I'm an anti arbitrager. So, I mean, those are. It's the, it's the same buyer persona that we're trying to sell to. You have to determine, you know, if you're looking to invest into a mastermind, invest into a course, the number one thing is, do you connect with that person? Number two, do you trust them? Would you let that person, in my opinion, would I let that person watch my 14-year-old daughter? You know, if I can get past that, then I'm willing to buy from them if I believe there's value. Do you think the value, like in, in the value of like your STR work, your uh, workshop you do, um, is the value in the information or the people coming to it? That's a great question. I think there's a combination of both. I can tell you at my first STR Wealth Conference, which is my big thousand person conference, I was in an Uber with John Hodge, the bank whisperer from my super team in Austin, Texas, meeting with a hedge fund company uh, two weeks prior to that conference. And the Uber driver overheard us going to meet a friend for breakfast before we flew home after our dinner meeting the night before talking about real estate. I sat in the car while John went into the coffee shop and talked to the Uber driver for 15 minutes, who was also a glass blower, third generation glass blower. And he's like, dude, I've been trying to get into real estate. It's really hard. I'm looking for, where can I learn? I said, dude, I'll change your fucking life, but you need to make a commitment to me. I'm going to give you a free VIP $2,500 ticket, but you need to be in Nashville June 7th and 8th. I don't care if you drive, you fly, however you get there, you sit in the front row and I'm going to be on stage and you better be fucking taking notes for the entire 16 hours that we're in there. And when you come back for the VIP dinner and you get to meet the speakers, I don't want you doing selfies and shit like that. You take fucking notes and then I want you to follow up with me every week for four weeks. You and I are going to have a call. And lo and behold, he did every one of those things and more. And he bought his first STR five months after attending that conference. So what I, what I can't answer to your question is how much of that was me or how much of that was his commitment and his desire. There are kids and adults that are coachable and kids and adults that are not coachable. This gentleman was coachable and he wanted it. And I think that's the thing or the people that lurk in the back that pretend to be busy on their phone, don't take notes. The ones that are in programs that aren't, I want to be the one in the front row asking the questions because I want to suck all the knowledge out of that room. 
that I can if I'm paying for it, right? And doesn't matter if it's 25 bucks or 25 grand. I think a lot of it has, how much do we want it? And how does that play into our demeanor? Are we really coachable? Because a lot of people say they are, but they're not open to learning new things. They think they know more than they do. Yeah, I would agree. That's very, that's very good. I, I think, and I can see the value too. And in, in having gone to a few conferences, like, I mean, it's just like, I mean, you don't, this isn't anything new to you, but, but the more you're around people who are more successful than you, the more that you're going to get, you're going to get access to drag into that tailwind almost kind of to, versus if you're just always around people who are as good as you, or you're the smartest guy in the room or girl in the room, then you're going to be hindered because you have to, you have to put yourself around other people. And uh, you're, you are a hundred percent correct. And that's what I'm talking about. Like in a mastermind or the super yeah. team war room, it's about the people that are in that as much as it is the people or person that owns it or is running it. Right. So the, the qualification process to get in for me at least is really important. That's why I paid to get into that mastermind. Cause the people that were in it were making 20, 50, hundred million dollars a year. They were the best of the best. Um, and I'm willing to pay to get into learn from the best of the best. I'm, I'm a huge believer. I, I'm, I don't want to say that I'm anti college or anti going to college, but I'm a huge believer that we have to continue to invest into our own continuing education, uh, as adults, even when you're successful. And I've learned that from successful entrepreneurs and CEOs that I've been able to be around. I'm, I'm Derek, I've been lucky. I mean, man, I was a, a golfer. And I was got really good as a sophomore in high school, like top 10 ranked in the world. So what you know what that got me? That got me access to all the wealthy business owners and CEOs. They wanted to play golf with little Billy the kid, you know. And so I got to play golf with him. And, you know, and, and as I was my junior year is when my mom helped me start my first business selling T-shirts out of the back of her 88 Ford Tempo. And, you know, I had these guys trying to teach me about financials and hey what's your margin what is a margin i don't know i know margins like on the three ring binder to the right when i'm making a bibliography or something like that i didn't know what was going on and they taught me that stuff um and at a young age when you you know when you hang around like you said when you hang around those people your entire life you just something's got to rub off and you learn through osmosis right and and i'll tell you i told you that i, I imported uh brazilian bikinis and um, swimwear and sarongs and beachwear and all that type of stuff from a family that I stayed with when I played golf down in South America. Well, I got an offer to, to, to sell out to Venus swimwear. And literally it was a multi-million dollar up front, or it was a residual of 7% on the back end of all my designs and all my SKUs in perpetuity. And man, I was taking the cash, but my CPA, Jeff Stewart, who is my uh, best man at my wedding, he's like, Bill, you don't want to take the cash. This is a big company. This was in, it was like 1994. Take your young kid, take the 7%. And that's what I ended up doing. I would have never done that, but he was smarter than I was. He, I wouldn't say he was smarter. He had more experience than I did at that point. And that was in 1994. It's 2023. I still get checks. They're not big. They're not huge anymore, but I still get checks. Today, they're small. They're now under a thousand bucks a month. But at one time, we're talking 15, 20 grand a month for a long period of time. That decision set me up to do a lot of the great things that I did in my life financially and through the startups. If I wouldn't have that capital, I wouldn't have the access. That's amazing. Can I, I'm going to ask you a question. If you tell me it's none of my business, that's fine. We'll, we'll edit it out. But have you, let me ask you a question about your kids. Do you feel like you've, has the entrepreneurship bug rubbed off on them? Were you intentional to teach them? Or are they like, that's what my dad does and I don't, I mean, like how, how is that? I, I have four children myself and this is nothing against them, but none of them have really caught on the entrepreneurial spirit at all. I would Not say that financial literacy with our children is one of the big things that we fail at as a society in teaching them. Absolutely. I have been yes. very successful in teaching my children about financial literacy. They understand the power of a dollar. They understand mm -hmm. the value of a dollar. Um, and I'm way more Dave Ramsey than I am Robert Kiyosaki, just FYI. I got that um, impression. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And, and they, I could throw a stone and hit Dave's house. He'd kill me yeah. if I was, you know, <laughs> taking out that. Um, but I've taught them the value of money. They under my, they, my oldest daughter, when she turned 16, I caught a lot of shit 
because she got a Land Rover for her birthday. But what people didn't realize on social media, it was six years old. It was my wife's that we gave to her. We put a bow on it. She's a 4.25 student. You know, she was soccer, travel soccer, you know, regionally, high schools, all this. She's a perfect child. My kids have no social media. They they read and they study. I can't even get them to go practice a sport or go outside. Hmm. Um, you know, I bought a place in Montana. We're going in July. They're doing everything they can to get out of it because they want to stay here and be have access to the library and Barnes and Noble and all that stuff. So, but the entrepreneurship, they want no part of short-term rentals or real estate. My oldest daughter, who could have played probably Division Two soccer as a goalkeeper, we were just literally today at a local college visit before this podcast. Um, quit playing. She's like, I'm not playing travel next year. I don't want to play in college. I just want to focus on my education and become a surgeon. And after a while after that, because she she felt like she disappointed me because I was the athlete and she knows I want, I, I believe that there's nothing better uh, than having a, a, you know, a collegiate experience. Because even though I dropped out of UCLA super early, I became a college golf coach for four years after that. And I saw what my kids went through and they absolutely loved it. Right. And I wanted her to have that experience, but she, she doesn't want to do anything that dad does, nothing. She wants to carve out her own path, and I commend her for that, and I support her for that. Um, my youngest daughter, we really don't know yet. She's 14. All she cares about is Taylor Swift and her golden doodle. Um, once a great student, but they're both on budgets. They both earn commission. They, they both have investment accounts. They understand about investing. And probably where I'm a little bit different, they know how much we pay for our real estate. They know how much mom and dad makes. They know how privileged they are to have the life that they have. We do not spoil them. Well, in our mind, we don't. Other people would definitely think that we do. Um, and they know where they live. That's something that's really important to me because of the influence for their social circles at school. Um, and, you know, we're in a, a neighborhood that the average home is probably $1.7 million. You know, that's... I guess more standard today after COVID, but you know, it's, it's, we don't live in a $300,000 house. I don't drive a 15 year old, you know, via, I drive a hundred thousand dollar Ford Raptor and they know the difference between a Ford Raptor and a regular Ford 150. They know, they know all of these things. Cause I want them to know, and I want them to understand when, you know, dad's in here at 6 PM recording a podcast with Derek, why I'm doing it and how it benefits our family. Right. And they understand those values, which is really, and I think the financial literacy, the value of money in their time, and then learning how to invest are the three core things that most kids don't have coming out of high school. Mine will be, have a very good understanding of how that works. Yeah. I think that's so good. I, I don't understand why people don't talk with their kids more about what they make, where they spend their money, how to, because then, then kids get out of the house and they don't know anything or they, or, you know, as Dave Ramsey would say, they try to adopt their parents' lifestyle. And I think some of it's just because they assume everyone can. 30% um, off of like my oldest daughter gets $200 a month for fuel, Barnes and Noble, whatever. And, but I take back 30% of that and 20% goes into her savings account. And she sees me transfer that into her, so she has no access to her savings account. She sees how much is in it. I let her, I, info, I teach her how the interest is growing in it, why it's in a money marketing account versus a checking account, all of those things. But the other 10% is tithing. And it yeah. took a while. It took You had to get to a certain age before they really understood the why we tithe, you know, and yeah. do those things. So I think just, just the mentality of taking 30% out of every penny they earn, you know, once they get a job and they're out on their own and, you know, tithing and saving will benefit them even if they didn't grasp everything else. Man, Bill, this has been a totally different conversation. I just read the book. Have you read the book, The Four Agreements? I have, have not. Read? Okay. Well, there's four agreements. One of them is don't make assumptions. Uh, I'm basically, I'm terrible at all four of the agreements, but I'm working <laughs> on it. But I I had an assumption of where this would go, and 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 uh, yeah, this has blown me away, man. Did I you think really, I was going to be pitching courses and stuff I, like that? Like I don't want to answer that, but I... I was you can, like, it's fine. It's like, ah, uh, the cynic Derek. But I, but I, I also think there's value in these courses. There is like people put time. Like for me, I coming out of the hotel <laughs> business, my secret strength in short term rentals is where, where I dominate the hotel business in my town is revenue management. I mm -hmm. don't understand listings. I'm not very good at marketing. I'm, 
I, I just, I get bored. My wife, we, we manage some other people's, or we co-host some other people's vacation rentals too. But where I can beat everyone in the hotel business is how to manage revenue as far as rates, length of stay, when to go up, when to go down, when to think six months from now, I'm in it every day. And that's how I win in the short-term rental market too. I probably could do a, I could probably learn a ton from you on marketing. Um, I have no idea where I was going with that. But oh, my thought was, you, there aren't very many courses on revenue management. Maybe and, me and uh, you could build a, a revenue management I, marketing course. And I'm like, if I could figure out the thing I love about Dave Ramsey, I, I stumbled on him years ago when he was still like regional, is he made financial conversations fun for people who don't care about money. Like if you and I are nerdy, we could talk about money all day. But my wife, I've got that three minute window before her eyes glaze over. Right. But Dave made it interesting. And it's like, if I could make revenue management interesting, I think, and I think, but I think there's value because there's just not a lot of people talking about. And a lot of people I've met with some great short-term rental operators who have no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about revenue management. Well, let's change the name first from yeah. revenue Well, that's management. probably, yeah, yeah. That's probably, you need something a little and, nicer. And you, you can have this, call it money maximization. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's and, really what it is. It's how you make more money, right? Right. It is. It is. And then, so my thought is, well, we could make a course and we could sell it and, and yeah, but it would help people. So I see my point in all that, I guess, getting back is that I, there is value and I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think I came from a very cynical background. I had some issues with multi-level marketing growing up and stuff with my parents and things like that, that I don't talk about a lot, but, but I, uh, you know, I just came from that place where it's almost there's more money in in the course than there is in what they're teaching you to do. And and that's but no, this has been this has there's been There's a lot of that that's still out there, Derek. There's no oh, yeah. question. Oh yeah, no, I and know. There, and, there, and and believe me, there's people that would say that about stuff that have gone through my stuff and I would challenge them and it's one of the things that we track is we have a system that's able to track if they actually go through the stuff. And most of the people that complain and become a hater are the ones that just never put the effort in. Yeah. Yeah. You still have to do the work. So I've taken a lot of your time today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap up the recording here and we'll get you off in a moment. But thank you. Is there anything else you want to, that I should have asked you, you want to talk about, you want to mention? Um, no, I mean, I think we covered a lot in the, in this hour and I just, I'm really grateful for you to have me. And uh, hopefully I changed your opinion a little bit. That was that preconceived notion. And um, you know, I just, I, the only thing I would say is that you see my name down here at bill faith, F A E T H 73. That's my Instagram handle. It's the easiest way to get a hold of me. If you guys have any questions, um, I guess the only thing I didn't talk about today, I spend probably 40 to 60% of my time Monday, uh, through Friday pro bono, um, answering Instagram questions. I've got 27,000, um, you know, investors in my build short-term rental wealth Facebook group. Um, that's the only thing I would like to pitch. If you want to get into that, come and uh, get into my Build Short Term Rental Wealth Facebook group and, you know, happy to help you. I think it's one of the best Facebook groups. Once again, because of the quality of the people, we do pretty, pretty stringent vetting in there. And, you know, there's no sales, none of that type of stuff that's allowed, no promotion, no agents can list properties. You know, there's other channels to be able to do that stuff. So I think keeping it clean and um, I want to help people. And like I said earlier, I know that if I can help somebody and then when they're ready, you know, maybe they'll come back. I'll be lucky enough. They'll come back and buy something from me. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank Bill for giving up some time to talk to us. I appreciate you being a part of our conversation. I want to make sure you know we put all the important links from today's show in the handy show notes that you'll find below and whatever format you're listening to us on. And we'd ask you to check them out. The other thing I'd ask is if you found any value in our content, we'd love your help in spreading the word. I'd like to ask you to do me a favor and share it with someone else. Your support means the world to us, and together we hope to inspire others to achieve greatness. Here's one other simple fact. 98% of you have not subscribed to our channel. That means I'm talking to you. Yes, you. Don't look to the person next to you. I'm talking to you. 98% of you have listened, enjoyed our content, and haven't subscribed. I would be incredibly grateful if you'd take a moment to hit that subscribe button on whatever listening platform you're using. It's a small action. It goes a long way in supporting us and helping us spread this message further. Again, thank you for tuning in. And guess what? We're going to have new podcasts coming out three times this week. Don't just be a passive listener, though. Embrace the work you were meant to do and make each day truly amazing. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. 
We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.